Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. You're listening to The Drag. Murder will out. Run down the midnight assassins. Keep your doors bolted and windows securely fastened. By now, more than a year after the murders began, dozens of people have been arrested in connection with the eight murders and many other attacks. Jimmy Phillips spends time in jail for his wife's murder. With a lack of answers, the city is left with nothing but random theories. The most compelling and unsettling theory is published in the Austin Daily Statesman on January 14th. Do sane men calmly plot and carry into effect horrible murders under the glare of the light of the moon? A Statesman reporter looks back across eight murders. Molly Smith, Eliza Shelley, Mary Ramey, Gracie Vance, Orange Washington, Eula Phillips, Susan Hancock, and Irene Cross. All eight of the murders took place within a week of a full moon. You might hear the term lunatic now and think that it refers to someone who is mentally ill, which isn't exactly wrong. But the history of the term is hidden in the word itself. Jim Miles, the owner of Walking Tours of Austin and the tour guide you've heard throughout this podcast, explains it for us. So that there's this theory in the newspapers that it's a gang of men, of black men, being driven mad by a full moon. Uh, this, this idea seems ludicrous today, insane. Um, of course it is for several reasons, but the science of being driven mad by a full moon, like really mad, it's where the term lunatic comes from. Luna being moon and tick to strike, moonstruck. But it was believed as science in 1885 that a full moon could really drive a person beyond their normal limits to an alien place in their brain to commit these murders. People were desperate for, uh, desperate for theories. The idea that a full moon causes an increase in crime is still common today. Countless research studies have looked into the theory that the moon affects human behavior, but no clear correlation has been found. However, if you lived in Austin in the 1880s, the lunatic moon theory might be something you'd believe in. One of the reasons we talk, write, and read about true crime so often is, I think, a desperate need to assign meaning to such absurd outcomes. It's unexplainable to think that someone could break into someone's home in the dead of night and murder them with an axe. It's baffling to think that somebody could kill someone in this manner eight times, including an 11-year-old. It's no wonder people at that time latched onto any theory that seemed even remotely plausible. After months of calls for vigilante justice and the appointment of citizen watchmen throughout the city of Austin, it's no surprise what happens on January 22nd, 13 months since the first murder. At 9.30 a.m., Sidney Brown, a black man, is lynched. He's attacked by a mob, calling for justice after he is accused of mugging and murdering a white man the day before. Brown admits to the crime and asks God for forgiveness, before the mob hangs him from a hickory tree about a mile outside of Austin. The Austin Daily Statesman defends the lynching in the papers two days later. The Rockdale lynchers were the type of a large and growing element in the state, composed of people of good citizens who worn out and disgusted with the failure of the court machinery to put down crimes of the class perpetrated by the Negro Brown, in pure self-defense are forced to become themselves the dispensers of justice and the executors of laws not enforced by their agents. I'm Megan Parker, the host of this podcast, and this is the final episode of Devilish Deeds.
It's January 1st, 1886, a new year in Austin, Texas. But most of the city isn't celebrating. The city's residents are terrified. On Christmas Eve, the unknown serial killer changed his common approach and started murdering white women, killing Eula Phillips and Susan Hancock the very same night. Eula's husband, Jimmy, was badly injured in the attack, but he's still thrown in jail for the murder. And on January 28th, Susan's husband, Moses, joins him there for allegedly murdering his wife. After months of the newspapers publicly proclaiming the killer or killers must be black or a gang of black men, two white men sit in jail. The statesman writes that Hancock's arrest mostly hinges on the fact that he and Susan did not, quote, live peaceably together, and that she once told their minister that she thought her husband would kill her. The next day, a statesman reporter arrives at the jail to interview Hancock. The reporter grills him. Does he know anything about an axe found in the house? What about a letter his wife, Susan, wrote to her sister about her fear of him? He doesn't know, he says. The reporter asks him if he has a problem with going on extended drinking benders, and he says yes, but no longer than two days. The reporter asks Hancock if he ever abused Susan while he was drunk, and Hancock says, damningly, that he doesn't think so. It's not a convincing statement, but the newspapers mostly believe him. The San Antonio Express write that there's no evidence against him, but the investigators aren't so sure. A city marshal visits from Waco, a town about 100 miles north of Austin, to help with the investigation, and he says he's positive that Hancock murdered his wife. He also thinks that the murders are the work of multiple people, not just one killer. Again, the term serial killer won't be coined until the 1970s, nearly 100 years after the crimes, so law enforcement has zero means of spotting these patterns. Despite the fact that a handful of men sit in jail for the crimes, a reward is offered, and the dollar amount tells you everything you need to know about the value of black life in the 1880s. The Citizens Committee offers $1,000 for information on the murder of a white victim, Eula Phillips, another $1,000 for information on the other white victim, Susan Hancock, and then $1,000 information on all the murders of the black victims combined. The dollar amount that values their lives are valued at one-sixth of the white victims. Just days after Moses Hancock is arrested, they let him go. There's simply not enough evidence. But Jimmy Phillips, Eula's husband, is still in jail awaiting trial. The newspapers predict he'll get off too, simply because Hancock did. He's still badly injured from the attack. It's February 12, 1886. Jimmy Phillips arrives at court for a pretrial hearing. He walks into the courtroom as his hands tremble and he becomes unsteady on his feet. He's normally a handsome man, according to newspapers, but today he looks pale and feeble. Witness after witness is brought in. Do you promise to tell the truth? In the 1880s, most trials took place behind closed doors, and this one is no different. The statesman manages to piece together a good deal of the evidence, but we don't know the specific details of a lot of the testimony. One witness talks about the bloodhounds trailing the footprints out of the Phillips' property, stopping where the footprints stopped, where it seemed the murderer must have put on his shoes. Three days into the hearing, things aren't looking great for Jimmy Phillips, despite the lack of physical evidence against him. Many witnesses say Jimmy and his wife didn't get along at all. Jimmy's own mother even talks about one of the times the married couple argued. She testifies that the night Eula died, she asked her son if Eula was dead, and he said if she is, quote, then I'll go to hell. There's a black woman who works at a local assignation house, which is sometimes defined as a brothel, but sometimes defined as the 1800s version of a motel you could rent by the hour or by the night. Regardless, she's got a story to share in court. She says in late November or early December, So about a month before Eula's death, Eula came and stayed for two weeks. Eula was apparently afraid of her husband, who could be a pretty violent drunk. The witness says she went to pick up clothes for Eula from Miss Phillips, Jimmy's mom, meaning Eula's mother-in-law knew she was staying at the Assignation House 
and not at home with her husband. So Jimmy's own mother knew something was going on in his marriage. Then, Jimmy's sister comes forth. She says she knew about Eula meeting up with other men and frequently cheating on Jimmy. More testimony proves that Eula might have been meeting up with the man to have an affair on the night that she died. Witnesses say she visited an assignation house around 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve. It's not clear if it's the same house she stayed in while she was afraid of her husband. She talked with the mistress of the house for about five minutes, then returned home, where she thought her husband would be waiting for her drunk and angry at her for leaving. A rumor will emerge later that she'd actually been having an affair with the Texas State Controller, and that that's who she met with that night. The newspapers will quickly strike down the rumors. The case is all but decided at this point. Since Eula had been cheating on her husband, the evidence makes it clear to everyone in the courtroom. Jimmy Phillips must have killed his wife in a fit of rage as revenge for being unfaithful to him. The statesman even publishes what they believe must have happened that night. As the theory has it, she expected a war of words, if not something worse, from her husband. Anticipating this and to intimidate, if not to protect herself from a violent assault, she herself secured the axe and carried it into the room, not dreaming for a moment that it was to be the instrument of a tragedy and she the victim, which was to send a thrill of horror, not only through the city, but the entire state and the entire country. Entering the room, her husband, who, perhaps with his and her pratting child by his side, had been brooding over her conduct, was infuriated at her appearance, and assaulting her received the blow which wounded him at her hands. This made him more furious than ever, and in a moment of frenzy he wrenched the axe from her hand, and with a blow nerved by anger, pain, and harrowing wrongs, he struck her down. Jimmy Phillips is sentenced to jail without bail as he awaits his trial. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. Jimmy Phillips' trial officially begins on May 24th. The courtroom is packed with curious onlookers wanting to hear the latest about the murders. And it's May in Texas, so there's obviously no air conditioning. It's sweltering inside the courtroom. One of the first witnesses for the trial is his mother. She talks about the arguments she witnessed between Jimmy and Eula, and she presents even more damning evidence against Jimmy. She says that only two people knew where Eula slept, and both of them lived in Williamson County, which is a neighboring county north of Austin. The court also finds out more about the time Eula spent away from her home when she was afraid of her husband. Not only did she stay in the assignation house for two weeks, but after her stay there, she went to a family member's house and then to Elgin, a town about 25 miles east of Austin. Mrs. Phillips doesn't say how long Eula stayed there, just that she was there long enough for Jimmy to go find his wife and bring her back to Austin. The woman who works at the brothel, the one who testified in the pretrial hearing, also comes back to the stand. She tells the same story about Eula and her sister coming to stay at the house. There are at least nine witnesses throughout the six-day trial. A friend of Eula's relays a few stories about her supposed romantic affairs. Eula's uncle tells the court that he remembers Jimmy coming to him when Eula was staying in Elgin in the months before she died. And he says Jimmy, who was drunk, pulled out a penknife and threatened to kill any man who came near her. One of Eula's sisters recalls a memory of Jimmy once throwing a cup of milk at Eula's head because he was jealous and angry. A doctor also testifies, saying that the injuries to Eula's head would have caused instant death. 
There's also testimony from a woman who lived in the Phillips home the night Eula was killed. The woman, Annie Dyer, says that she saw Eula's body, the dirt and sticks in her hair and the blood all over her. She said that weeks before the murder, she heard Jimmy tell Eula, quote, God damn you, I will kill you. One of the investigators who came to the scene the morning after Eula's murder says his best bloodhound pointed toward Jimmy as the killer. The investigator says the hound went straight from the scene of Eula's body into the bedroom and sniffed Jimmy. The newspaper calls this the most entertaining testimony of the trial, and it ends up being some of the most important testimony. Phillips, the noted trial nearing the end. The defense's argument hinges mostly around the extent of Jimmy's wounds. Doctors testify to say that there's no way Jimmy's injuries could have been self-inflicted, and he must have been attacked by the same person who attacked Eula. The defense also says Jimmy doesn't match the bloody footprints and handprints found at the scene of the murder. He dips his bare feet into ink and climbs onto a piece of wood to make footprints to prove that his tracks don't match the ones discovered that night. They even make him simulate carrying a body as he lifts a man in his arms to see if the weight changes his footprints. Still, no match. Thus has one, at least, of the long list of murders in this city been fastened by a jury upon its alleged perpetrator. The day after the testimony begins, the jury delivers its verdict. Jimmy Phillips is guilty in the killing of his wife. He's sentenced to seven years in the state penitentiary. And, less than a week after Jimmy is found guilty, Moses Hancock is rearrested and charged with murder. He's the husband of Susan Hancock, who died the same night as Eula Phillips. It almost seems like investigators are thinking, well, if Jimmy's guilty, then Moses must be too. Hearings begin almost immediately, as does witness testimony. A friend claims Moses didn't care when his wife was sick, and that once, he ignored her when she was trying to talk to him. A 12-year-old girl testifies, claiming she heard a drunken Moses call his wife a son of a bitch. It all feels like the testimony is just as tenuous as in Jimmy Phillips' trial, until a neighbor testifies that she talked to Susan Hancock, the night she died. The neighbor says Susan asked him if he could take her husband into town and she would stay the night at the neighbor's house with his wife because she was afraid Moses might hurt her if she stayed in the house with him. The neighbor asked Moses to go into town with him and he declined, but the neighbor went anyway. When he got home, Susan Hancock was dead. Susan's sister testifies, saying she doesn't think Moses would hurt her sister, but that he is a drunk. Other than that, she says, he's a perfect gentleman. Other witnesses share similar thoughts. None of them had ever seen Moses and Susan argue, unless Moses had been drinking. It's all pretty straightforward and relatively drama-free, until Susan's daughter, Lena, takes the stand. She shares a letter that her mother had written. There's no date on it, but Lena reassures the court it was written long before her mother died. Lena had kept it in a box of artificial flowers until her mother died. Dear husband, I have lived with you 18 years and have always tried to make you a good wife and help you all I could. I have loved you and followed you day and night. You won't quit whiskey, and I'm so nervous I can't stand it, you know. It almost kills me for you to drink, and Lena is almost crazy and will lose her mind. If I was to do anything to disgrace you and our children, you would leave me, and you would have quit me long ago. Take good care of yourself. Write to me at Waco, and I will answer every letter. Your wife until death, Sue Hancock. We don't know why Susan didn't give her husband the letter but it was hard for women to leave their husbands at this time. Most wives were financially dependent on their husbands, and divorce was expensive. Even though women are no longer considered property by the 1880s, that's a legal change that takes a long time to take effect, and a social change that takes even longer. The most damning testimony against Moses Hancock comes from Joseph Gassaway, 
one of Moses' friends. The city marshal had hired Gasway to keep an eye out on Moses after Susan died, as an undercover officer of sorts. Gasway had been tasked with getting Moses out of town and out of investigators' way. So two months after the murders, when Moses tells him he wants to leave Austin too, Gasway is on board. The two men went to Fort Worth in North Texas, then boarded a train for West Texas. Gasway says it was on this trip that Moses suddenly changed his story about the night of his wife's murder. He claims he saw two men the night of the murder, one who was carrying Susan's body. Moses told Gasaway he tried to accost the two men, but they threatened him with a gun, and Moses threw a brick at them. A few nights later, Moses and Gasaway were drinking together, still in West Texas. Gasaway says Moses was drunk, but he told Moses that he himself needed to stop drinking. Moses seemed to take offense to this, considering it a betrayal of sorts. When Gasaway ironically promised Moses he would never betray him, Moses said, Them damn sons of bitches down at Austin are trying to work up something on me, but they've not got anything, nor never will, out of me. The two men were gone for months, so Gassaway's got a lot of stories. One night in March, Gassaway asked Moses if he thought his daughters would point to him as guilty. Moses said no, that they think too highly of him and wouldn't suspect him. Another night in April, Moses swore the investigators couldn't prove anything, and in most of these stories, Moses was drunk. Despite saying some suspicious things, he never, not once, implied that he murdered his wife. The case moves forward, slowly. Hearings continue for the better part of a year. It's not until the following June, a year after Moses was arrested, after Jimmy Phillips had already submitted an appeal maintaining his innocence, that something interesting comes out of the case against Moses Hancock. In fact, it's on the very last day of the trial. Moses Hancock's defense attorney, the same one who defended Jimmy Phillips, who was still in jail for his wife's murder, brings up a baffling point. During closing arguments, the lawyer says, there have been no more murders since the double murder on Christmas Eve. That in fact, no women in Austin have been attacked since the death of a man named Nathan Elgin. Let's rewind to February 8, 1886, a Monday night. Nathan Elgin, a black man, is at a saloon drinking. It's crowded for a Monday. Some black men gather outside of the saloon entrance to watch Elgin as he fights with a black woman named Julia. Elgin knocks her over, beating her, and dragging her to a house two blocks away. He continues to beat her until three men come to her aid, including the saloon owner and a policeman. As the men approach, they hear Elgin threatening to kill Julia as he violently kicks her. They try to pull Elgin off of the young woman, but he slashes a knife at them. So the policeman tries to handcuff him, but then Elgin hits the officer in the head. By now, a crowd has assembled to watch the tussle. Someone in the crowd fires a gun, and the police officer reacts, probably still dazed from the fighting. He fires his gun too, and hits Elgin. The bullet lodges in his spinal column. The shot paralyzes Elgin, and he dies four days later. As I've mentioned before, Investigators going to crime scenes throughout 1885 had hardly any forensic tools. One of the few methods they have is to look at and measure footprints from crime scenes. Several footprints have been found near multiple of the crime scenes that suggest the killer was missing a toe. The day Nathan Elgin dies, the statesman makes a shocking revelation. Elgin was missing his little toe. The theory that Nathan Elgin could be the infamous midnight assassin feels like the most obvious one in many ways, but it's far from the only one. That's the thing about murders like these, the thing about the passage of time and the way this story has been told for generations. The original evidence is rudimentary. The facts get tangled. It's hard to tell the truth from fiction. But in these past four episodes, you've heard what we do know. So now it's time to talk about what could have happened and what might have happened. 
because we may never know who killed those eight people in Austin, Texas over the span of a year in 1885. We talked about the lunatic theory at the beginning of this episode, the idea that men could be driven mad by the moon and that they were possessed by something outside of themselves to commit murder. You just heard about Nathan Elgin, the black man missing a toe who had a known history of violence. But there are other theories too. Our downtown Austin history tour guide, Jim Miles, has a favorite, and it's one that the author, Skip Hollinsworth, presented in his book, The Midnight Assassin, as well. Skip goes down a really cool trail of possibility that the killer may have been a man named James Given, who was uh, the assistant superintendent, a physician here in Austin. Shortly after the first murder in late 1884, James Given married the daughter of Dr. Ashley Denton, the superintendent of the State Lunatic Asylum, located in what was then the outskirts of Austin. Given was the assistant superintendent. Presumably, the two have a happy marriage and are a normal couple, until, about a year into their marriage, shortly after the final two murders, Given is committed to the very asylum where he works. Dispensation is given as the reason. Like, what does that mean? It's a very vague term. It means he'd lost control of his senses. It was often used uh, for alcoholics. Um, maybe a psychological, you know. But the problem with that is there were others in Austin, his friends and uh, society as a whole, that said James was perfectly together. He was with it. He was sharp. He was the life of the party. And suddenly he's you know, committed. And you can't just throw a dude in an insane asylum, you know, or anyone in those days. Uh, you had to have signatures. It had to go through the proper process and everything else. Yet everyone agreed that he should be put away. And then a short time later, he, sh he shift shipped up to off to another branch of Austin's uh, um, uh, lunatic and insane asylum uh, and dies. Given dies in that asylum at the age of 34 from what a newspaper article just describes as, quote, brain disease. You know, that's a, it's an interesting theory. Uh, could it have been? Was, did James, uh, you know, con contract syphilis, as was the rumors of the day, and as that's eating into his mind, causing him to go mad, which was a, was a pretty common, uh, uh, common way to go insane in those days. Did he start exacting his revenge on servant girls or, you know, um, maybe contracted his disease from a servant girl? Who knows? There's another interesting page to that uh, that I tell on my tour, and that is when James was uh, educated in Europe and uh, in a, his medical university. One of his fellow classmates was Robert Louis Stevenson, who would go on to write Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And wow, you know, those ideas were planted in his head and he moves to Austin and he decides to bring fiction to reality on the streets of Austin. Who knows? It's certainly a theory that would go over well on murder tours out the city of Austin on late cold nights like the one we went on. But it's not the one Jim tells on the tour on the night we were there. He changes his tour every night based on the group and whether he's running on time or not. He usually presents a different theory at the end regarding who the killer may have been. And on this particular February night in Austin, he goes for the big one. He brought it up in a separate interview with us, too. Here he is chatting with our executive producer, Katie Alka. She's been studying these murders for years, and she knows all the theories. There's a, a tendency to scoff at the possibility that our killer may have been none other than, do you want to say it? Yeah, Jack the Ripper, there you obviously. Go. There yeah. you go. So that's the goosebumps. That's the one that draw, draws the most attention. Uh, people laugh at that theory. I do not, and I can say I do not. I think it's uh, not just possible. I think it's it's plausible. I mean, you can't discount it. We don't know. Do you know that we don't know who the killer was in Austin? And we do not know who Jack the Ripper was. And I... I could uh, now people think they know, but we don't know for sure. Here's the backstory for the Jack the Ripper theory. As the story goes, during the time of the murders, there was a cook working at the Pearl House Hotel in Austin. His name was Maurice, and he was Malaysian. The cops working the servant girl murders arrested him the night of one of the murders because he was plastered drunk. So drunk, they figured he couldn't have murdered anyone. So they let him go. But then, just days after the deaths of Eula Phillips and Susan Hancock, Maurice leaves town. 
So, New Year's Day, 1886, four days after the double murder, officers go to the Pearl House Hotel. Remember, Maurice was the cook at the Pearl House. They knock on the door because Maurice was scheduled to work that morning. Only guess what? It's not there. Maurice is gone. It's so it's the story that the proprietor, the owner of the hotel, told the cops is the reason we're still talking about this. Now, I'm not sugarcoating this. This is what she said. Maurice was scheduled to work that morning, and he came to work earlier in the morning, and he demanded his pay for the rest of the week, and he said he was leaving Austin. In fact, Jim told us on the tour that night, Maurice didn't just say he was leaving Austin. He said he was going to Galveston, Texas, a city on the Gulf Coast more than 200 miles from Austin. At the time, Galveston was the largest city in Texas and was known for its commercial ports. Maurice boarded a ship bound for London, England. It is a fact that after 1886, thank goodness there's not another bloody murder on the streets of Austin. Not another woman hacked to death in the middle of the night with a blade. But it is a curiosity at least that just two years later, in 1888, just outside of London, in a borough called Whitechapel. The murders begin again. It's true what Jim says, that most people scoff at this theory. Even the author and journalist Skip Hollinsworth did. He admits it in his book, The Midnight Assassin. Hollinsworth went to Galveston to see if Maurice's name was on a ship log from that time, and it wasn't. It doesn't discount the theory entirely. Record keeping in the 1880s wasn't exactly immaculate, However, Hollinsworth looked into a few other Jack the Ripper connections, and the trail led nowhere. But even if it isn't true that these killers are one and the same, it's an eerie coincidence. Like Jim says, that's the goosebump moment. It's the theory that ties his whole story up with a nice little bow. It explains what happened to an extent, or at least it points us closer to some kind of answer regarding what happened that year in Austin. But there are no answers. There's no resolution that would tie the story up with a nice little bow. There's not even a theory that I can offer you that seems the most realistic, because there is so little that's known about what happened in Austin during these murders. When researching for this podcast, we found another possible theory. There were articles from the San Antonio Light that detail a string of eerily similar crimes that happened in San Antonio, about 80 miles southwest of Austin, just two months before the Austin murders started. On the night of October 27, 1884, five homes were broken into and six women were attacked on South Alamo Street in San Antonio. The paper details that the crimes occurred one after another, with the intruder entering through the window of the servants' quarter and attacking the women as they lay asleep in bed. There's even one instance where the intruder attempted to murder a woman with the chloroform cloth and dragged her out of her yard, but ultimately fled before, quote, committing the deed. According to the newspaper, one of the servant women attacked described her would-be despoiler of chastity as a very stout white man. Then, the very next day, news comes out that two more attacks occurred in San Antonio. At first, the police are certain that only one man was responsible for the crimes, but the paper attributes the crimes to a gang of lustful villains. The city says it will put together a vigilance committee to patrol the streets. After this, the crimes cease in San Antonio. Katie Outka, the executive producer of this podcast who you've heard interviewing our tour guide, Jim, has been looking into these murders for nearly a decade. She dove into these stories just after she graduated from the University of Texas when she was looking into ghost stories she could write about while working at a local TV station. She's the one who had the idea for this podcast because this story has been on her mind for so long. Here's Katie. You know, the most difficult thing about working on a story like this one is that as a journalist, you're always looking for answers, right? Like you're always looking for some way to tie things together or something that someone else hasn't looked into yet or hasn't discovered. And so I've spent a long time trying to do that. I've read probably 10 or a dozen different books about these murders, including some really, really bad ones. And, you know, every journalist has those stories that they cover that stick with them forever. And You know, my career in local news over the last 10 years has left me with my fair share of those types of stories that stick with me. But this is honestly probably the one I spend the most time thinking about. And it's mainly because I just want to know why any of this happened. It's not even about finding out who did it. It's the why. 
And that's the thing we'll never know. We'll most likely never know why any of this happened. We won't know why black women were the primary targets. We won't know if these women woke up in the middle of the night, saw the intruder, and recognized him as a familiar face, or felt terrified at the face of a stranger. We won't know if it was one man or several. We won't know if the killer was enacting some racist vendetta against black domestic servants, or if the killer simply had what the newspapers called a thirst for blood. Even though Eula Phillips was the last confirmed victim of the Midnight Assassin, Austinites lived in fear for years. A decade after the murders began, the city installed moonlight towers, giant structures that stood 165 feet tall and provided outdoor lighting from the city's first power plant. The city built 31 towers in 1894, and 17 of them still stand today, illuminating the city's streets. It's a stretch to say that the moon towers were installed because of the serving girl annihilator, even though that's a favorite piece of local lore. But the outdoor lighting didn't make the city streets safer. It would be difficult for a murderer to slip away in the shadows with 31 massive towers lighting up the night. The majority of the victims are buried in Austin's Oakwood Cemetery, just a city block away from one of those moon towers. It's the oldest city-owned cemetery in the city. It sits just a few blocks east of downtown, right across the street from the University of Texas baseball stadium. It spans 40 acres, a huge piece of property in the heart of East Austin, a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood where real estate prices soar well into the millions. In the 1880s, it would have been relatively isolated, about a mile and a half from the city center. Plenty of notable Austinites and Texans are buried here. Survivors of the Battle of the Alamo, former governors and military generals, and even an amateur tennis player. Susan Hancock, the penultimate victim of the killing spree, is buried here. So are the black victims. At least, historians think many of them are buried there. They're not positive because they're buried in a mass, unmarked section of the cemetery reserved for people of color and those who didn't have the financial means for proper burials. It looks like an empty plot of land. There's nothing to indicate how many people are buried here, let alone who they are. The city of Austin is looking to change that. In the past year, city officials have begun work to identify the more than 2,700 people buried in the unmarked section of Oakwood Cemetery. The city even released the names of people known to be buried in the area. At least two of the last names matches the last names of victims Ramey and Washington. The city has asked people who know their ancestors are buried in Oakwood to come forward to help out with possible DNA matching. It's a step toward laying the victims and everyone else buried there to rest with the respect they deserve. Until then, that's yet another piece of the story we don't know. What we do know is that the horrific murders continue to live on in Austin's collective memory. Every single person we talk to for this podcast agree that these murders, despite taking place nearly 140 years ago, sticks around in our memories for a reason. Here's Michael Barnes, the statesman columnist and Austin history expert, talking to Lori Grope, a UT student who helped us report on this podcast. Do you think the murders still have relevance today? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for many, many reasons. When you look at um, the fact that they're among the first documented serial uh, murders. They start a pattern that you see in uh, 20th century and later uh, serial killings, especially the um, uh, women who are outside of um, the domestic sphere um, being targeted. Jack the Ripper targeted prostitutes. People, all, uh, serial killers all through the, the 20th century, not all of them, but a lot of them, because they were vulnerable, they didn't have protection. That aspect of it, I think, is still interesting and, and, and worth studying. I think, too, the way that the media responded to it and how that shaped later crime reporting. And I think also, you get, we've talked about this, but you get a portrait of a city living in fear. Here's Lauren Henley, the University of Richmond professor who extensively researched these murders. So the memory of these killings, I think, is incredibly salient. If we think about the young woman whose body was just found, right, the young white woman who was <laughs> van lifing around the world, her body was found. Right? And there have been plenty of women of color who have been missing for months, 
who have not galvanized the same amount of national attention. Um, and the same thing happened here, in which when Eula Phillips was killed, the city was upset. And now there are some speculations about who Eula knew and sort of how she was related to the who's who, the creme de la creme of Austin society. And yeah, she was young and white and a mother. So she did have this sort of immediate attraction and draw, but also Mary <laughs> Ramey was 12 years old and murdered. Like the people who cared about Mary Ramey's death were Austin's black community and the, the larger sort of black community in Texas. And so we have these disparate reactions to what happens to society's most vulnerable populations. And when we interplay issues of race, right, we always see that like, society will always privilege whiteness. Here's Jenna Cooper with the Austin History Center. It is a sort of illuminating part of um, Austin's racist past that needs to be considered and remembered. And I think too, you know, um, that these women, they all deserve to be remembered, Um, not predominantly for what happened to them, but, but for who they are and the fact that they lived and that they loved and that they had, um, um, that they were con- all contributing members to the community. And here's Jim Miles, our ghost tour guide, who says we can learn a lesson from these murders and from every true crime story. Human beings will always be captivated by the topic of death. And fear is a great motivator. More than that, it's the other side of fear. It's safety, really, is what we want, isn't it? So to know the serial killer is to kind of have control over it, power over it, when in reality there's no... I mean, if you're targeted, you're targeted. Now there's ways to keep yourself safe. I could give a whole podcast on that. Uh, But I think the attraction is the unknown. I think it's the same reason we tell ghost stories around campfires, where it's safe and uh, we're talking about, you know, something that is uh, can be terrifying in other realms but if you can control it if you can talk about it if you can understand it you know maybe a little bit feel a little safer in control of your own destiny it's more than a ghost story for me it's a reminder of how fragile life can be and how black women were treated throughout american history i hope this podcast helps to remind people that these victims existed and that they are not forgotten This podcast is hosted, reported, and produced by me, Megan Parker. It's also reported, written, and produced by Mina Anderson and edited by Katie Pinchik Outka. Sound design by Matt Bolin. Robert Quigley and Katie Pinchik Outka are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Mooney College of Communication. The associate producers are Cameron Greiser, Sewa Oliveres, Bethany Stork, Miranda Vilches, Kadeja Balde, Ashley Misnazi, Lori Groby, Lakin Nauman, and Sumaya Malik. Thank you to our voice actors, John Bridges, Christian McDonald, Emmanuel Ogu, Kosi Maloku, Gerald Johnson, Kevin Robbins, Raul Hernandez, Emily Quigley, and Robert Quigley. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all of her support and guidance. We also want to thank Dean J. Bernhardt, Kathleen McElroy, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, Kathleen Mabley, Ann Jorgensen, Emily Quigley, and Jay Whitman of the Moody College of Communication. And special thanks to Robert Vilwalk and Ann Sellers. Additional sound effects are from zapsplat.com. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students an amazing educational experience. Thank you.